The easiest methods implementing indirect write or deferred update as we also called it is TwinBlock. The idea in TwinBlock is really really easy. You keep two versions for each block, that is an old consistent version and a new possibly inconsistent version. In addition to that you have an atomic switch indicating which of those versions is currently considered the consistent version. So the roles of those two versions change in the method. Let's look at an example. So let's assume we have a modifying transaction T1. T1 wants to modify the file and the file consists of blocks from 0 to 4. However, each block exists in two different versions. There's an A version and a B version for each and every block. In addition to that, we need a pointer to the consistent version. The pointer may be set to A or B. Currently it's set to A, indicating that A is a consistent version. So for each block, A contains a consistent version of the file. To start with, I assume that the A and the B versions contain the same data. Let's assume T1 is interested in block number 1. So it will read the B version of block number 1 into main memory. Then it might modify that version and eventually it will also write it back to the B version. So basically T1 can do whatever it wants on the B version, it doesn't really matter because we are not destroying the A version. As long as we are not writing over the A version, everything is fine. Maybe it reads another block, let's say block number 3, modifies that to become B prime, writes it back again on the file and now we have it here in the new version. Then there are two situations that may occur at this point in time. So the first is we want to commit T1. So how could we commit the changes done by transaction 1? Well, it's very easy. We just have to change the pointer, right? We just have to say, well, before the A version reflected the consistent version, now we want B to be called the consistent version. So it's as simple as switching this pointer to become B. Here we go. Now we have a consistent database again. So this is really easy. So what we also have to make sure is that those versions, this is different from this one and this is different from this one. So switching this is not enough. You also have to, have to copy the contents of B3B prime over B3A and B1B prime over B1A. That's what we do in the next slide. So we copy it over. So the contents of the blocks are equal. Those blocks are equal with respect to their content, those blocks are equal and then we, call it, then we call it B1A again. So we are back in the initial situation. So we have again all blocks in two versions, logically in two versions, here physically they contain the same data and the B version is now called the consistent version. That's the thing that changed. Now we are at B. If another transaction now comes in, let's say T2 wants to modify anything, wants to read anything, it has to operate on A. So here it doesn't matter whether it reads from A or B. It would make a difference though if B were already modified by another transaction. Then we should be careful if there's an inconsistent version on B and, uh, that's different from the A, from the consistent version, then we have to take care what to read. And of course, with respect to writing, it makes a huge difference because if, if you want to write this down, we may never touch B here. That's not allowed because B is the consistent version. You can also assume that B is read only. Read, you're not allowed to write anything over B as B is called the consistent version. That's like a snapshot of the old state, of the old consistent state of the database. So, but let's go back to the situation well, we're here. We're, T1 changed something, but now we don't want to commit T1. We actually want to abort T1 for whatever reason. Maybe the user is saying that, maybe there's a crash, whatever, whatever. We don't want those changes to end up in the database. How do we do that? Well, it's relatively easy, right? Because we don't have to change this pointer. 
we don't have to tell the database to make B the consistent version. We can keep this and never change it. So A is still the consistent version. So we don't switch the global pointer to the consistent version. So the only thing that's a problem currently is that this B version was overwritten. So this is not the same data as that data anymore. And the same holds for those two blocks. So the only thing we have to do is again, we copy this over that and that over that. Here we go. And now both blocks contain the same data again. So you see inserting changes in this file can be done in a consistent way, but also rolling back aborting changes can be done in a very, very easy way. So and again, here in this situation where you abort it, remember that you didn't switch the pointer. So if another transaction T2 comes in, it'll now operate on B, as B will be considered the inconsistent or the possibly inconsistent version. So to wrap up this method, What's very nice here is um, there are no extra data structures required other than this global pointer. That's all you need to make this happen. An undo of changes is really easy and there's no fragmentation. Fragmentation means you have two domains of numbers. Assume logical block numbers. Logical block numbers, and we have that many, many times already in the context of hard disks. And they are translated to physical addresses. If you have a logical block numbering, say from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, blah, 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 and so forth. And then you have, and then you have physical block numbers. Yeah, that's maybe the same domain. But the interesting thing is, how do the logical blocks get mapped to the physical blocks? So if it's a mapping like this, we will call this a highly clustered mapping. The, in, in, other words, in other words, the arrows don't go crisscross. That's usually what we want to have because if it's in this situation, we can make assumptions on the physical layout of the data. Even though we're operating on the logical level with respect to the numbers, we know something about the physical layout. We can exploit that when accessing specific logical blocks by their logical block number. As we know, if two numbers are closed in logical space, they're also closed in physical space. That's a very handy, very useful property we usually want to have. In contrast, assume the mapping is something like that. So again, we have numbers from, let's say, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, 1, 3, Okay, so if logical numbers are mapped to physical numbers like this, maybe zero maps, maps to five, and maybe five maps to three, let's say, two maps to one, one maps to four, three maps to six, six to zero, and so forth. So you see here the arrows go crisscross, and this means the layout is fragmented, which means the logical numbering doesn't really correspond to the physical numbering anymore. That is, when, that is what I mean when I talk about fragmentation. The logical numbering doesn't really co correspond anymore to the physical layout on the device. So in twin block, you avoid this. If you go back, we see here, because I mean, you have the logical block numbers and there's still a hidden mapping here, of course, because the user wants to access a block specifying only the logical block number. So the user will, will say something, I want to operate on block number one. That's what happened when we read the transaction, when we wrote the transactions. Or the A and B versioning is done by the method. So to the outside, there's no A and B. There's only the block number. So there's a hidden mapping here. Mapping the block number to either the A or the B version. And what I mean by having no fragmentation in TwinBlock is that this method preserves a layout like that. The, the, the method itself doesn't trigger this kind of fragmentation. So in another video, in the follow-up video, we will see a different method called shadow paging, which creates exactly this kind of fragmentation. And that's the problem of the method. But TwinBlock doesn't have that problem. So what are the disadvantages of twin block? Of course, it doubles the storage for all blocks. That's a problem. That's probably not what you want to have. However, 
this is no hard rule. If you really have a problem with fragmentation, maybe you want to go for something like TwinBlock. Then you pay the price of doubling the storage, but you don't have this problem. So it's often like that in databases. There's no single right, 100% right methods, 100% perfect method. It depends. It depends on what you want to have and what you're optimizing for. If you are willing to pay this price of doubling the storage, maybe TwinBlock is a nice idea. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Thank you. So if you want to see more database videos, be it in English or in German, take a look at my website datenbankenlernen.de. It has a couple of English and German videos. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel Jens Did, or you look at our website infosys.uni-silent.de. See you there.